And Jose, do you want to unmute your mic and join us? Absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. We got a full house. That's fantastic to see. This is uh, What is VRF with Samsung HVAC? Uh, and today we're going to be talking with Jose de la Portia about what is variable refrigerant flow systems, the ins and outs, the basics, and uh, dig, uh, dig it a little deeper than that. But first, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Jose. Um, and you can't see him, but Jose, say hello, please. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining today. <laughs> uh, now, Jose, your, your camera isn't, uh, internet's a little uh, shaky where you are right now, correct? Yeah, we've got one of those storms blowing through. So if I put on the camera, we'll lose me, but I'm going to stick with you guys via voice here. Fantastic. And you're, you're calling us from Texas, right? Correct. A little small town called Paradise, Texas. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Jose is a national training manager for Samsung HVAC. He's been in the industry for well, nearly 30 years worked in the service installation and technical support and training, which is his passion. So uh, uh, a perfect fit for our topic today. He's also a member of the Nate Technical Committee and ACCA certified in residential system design. So uh, no better person to talk to us about VRFs. And just a reminder before we get the presentation started, Nate, or sorry, Nate, Jose is happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, we'll be having a Q&A at the end of the presentation. But if you do have something um, pressing, uh, a question about a slide, please pop it in our Q&A and we can get to that as well. So without further ado, uh, Jose, please. Great. Thank you again, everybody, for joining today. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, meet with you. I pre appreciate the folks over at H uh, HRI AI that gave me this opportunity. And so I'm going to go through a presentation with you that we put together that is focused around what is VRF. Now, I know VRF has been out for years or a few years, but there's still a lot of people who have very little experience with it or really just have questions about what is VRF and, and how is it better than other products. So I'm going to cover those today. And again, have you asked, if you have questions, you can throw them in the chat box. If there's something pressing that you, you just got to get an answer before you can wrap your head around the next concept, just feel free to ask away and we'll take care of it. So first off, what is VRF? V VRF stands for Variable Refrigerant Flow. And what it does, it gives us the ability to have multiple indoor units connected to one outdoor unit. So on the image you see on the lower right-hand corner, there's one VRF outdoor unit. Uh, Samsung uses the terminology DVMS, Digital Variable Multi-S, as the generation. But you notice we have one outdoor unit, and then we have several Y joints that are splitting that refrigerant piping into two, four, six different indoor units in this example. Now, that's just a small example. You can get over 100 plus units on some of the systems. So VRF systems, they can either be a heat pump, which is your traditional heat pump, heating or cooling. But we also offer a product to you that is really unique. And that's a product called heat recovery, where you have multiple indoor units. They all have their own controller or their thermostat. They can individually be put into heating or cooling with one outdoor unit. So yes, one condensing unit can provide simultaneous heating and cooling, which is really unique. And it solves a lot of buildings, uh, a lot of indoor air uh, problems that we see in the HVAC industry. So it really is a solution for these things we've never had a, a real solid solution for. Now, the difference between VRF and VAV, VAV meaning variable air volume, which is essentially where we change the speed of the fan and open and close dampers to let airflow go into other spaces. But the problem is it's still a single unit on the roof, in the ground, on the ground, wherever it might be, it's still one unit. It might have two stages of compression or it might have you know, one stage of compression, but bottom line, it can do one thing. It can provide either hot or cooled air, but it's supplying a volume of it and only varying the airflow. Now on a VAV system, the outdoor unit doesn't know what the indoor boxes are doing. It tries to push the same amount of air but less is getting into the space. So unlike VAV, where we're messing with air flows, what we're actually doing is controlling the refrigerant network, much like you would see in a, refriger in a refrigeration side of the business, maybe in a supermarket, okay? It's taking that heavy duty refrigeration technology, but applying it to comfort cooling. So what we do is every indoor unit has its own controller to monitor, monitor temperature and humidity in those zones. And it sends a signal back to the outdoor unit and based on all of the operating operational parameters, the outdoor unit decides what it's going to do. Now, it's not single stage. It's not two stage. It's not five stage, where you have two to five distinct 
changes in operation. This is 100% truly variable, meaning that we put variable frequency drives or inverters on these compressors and fan motors. And the normal frequency that you would see a unit running at is say 60 cycles per second or 60 Hertz. And that would give us the standard speed, a standard speed for the outdoor unit. What we do with variable refrigerant flow is that we have each individual unit communicating back to the main control board in the outdoor unit. This is what I need. And the system adjusts itself accordingly to make sure it can meet the needs of every system. So unlike a traditional unit that's on or off, we can change that frequency, which will in turn change the capacity. We're not fixed at 60 Hertz. We can run these things instead of 60 cycles per second up to 160 cycles per second for fast cooling or heating or as low as 10 cycles or 10 Hertz cycles per second to make sure that we have very, very small amounts of refrigerant available when there's not a lot of load. And again, system capacity that's controlled based on the individual zone loads, the, individ the controller placed in each individual zone. Now that controller can be room by room or it can be a geographic similar lay layout. So maybe all the, the rooms facing east with glass, they're gonna have the same exposure that, and they're gonna want the same temperature. So you can control that zone as a group of rooms or you could have it room by room. Now here's what happens, which is very unique. And on the right hand side, I have this image of a, of a standard little green, a gray car going up and down every time it needs to accelerate and decelerate because it can't stay at the fixed pace. What VRF does is it's much like that green car. VRF, meaning the refrigerant flow that's supplied to the indoor units is normal rate. But as we get to the set point, instead of turning off and letting the temperatures in the space swing high, coming back low, we keep this thing at a desired rate. So once we hit the value that we need to deliver the right amount of refrigerant and to maintain temperature in the space, instead of running fast or slow, it's like putting cruise control on that compressor and it stays right at the sweet spot. The goal here is that if we keep that unit running as long as we can. Now you might be thinking, okay, longer run times, you know, that's gonna cost a lot of energy, but it actually is less, a lot less energy consumption because it stays, it uses less energy to keep something in motion than it takes to get it in motion. Also, because these are inverter driven, they're DC powered motors that have their frequency changed as needed, going up a little bit or down a little bit, make sure that we can keep the space comfortable with almost no electrical consumption. Okay, so as we look at the outdoor units, this is, this is a look at some of the outdoor units, our DVMS outdoor units, which is most manufacturers have something that looks very similar to it. But what we can do is we can take not only one outdoor unit, maybe this is a, a 12 ton, but we need a bigger system. We can take other VRF modules and combine them together. If you notice down here on these three modules, the piping comes out and they all Y into each other. Well, that's because as we do this, it becomes one much larger system. And you don't have to worry about stocking a bunch of different SKUs. You can carry an eight ton, a 10 ton, a 12 ton and combine them together to make the capacity that you need. And these provide superior efficiency at part load as well as at full load. So unlike part load conditions where you'd have to have a, a rooftop unit, maybe a bypass damper or variable frequency drive to slow down the fan, but the refrigerant cycle was still full capacity, you don't have to do that. These can run extremely well at low load conditions. And I'm gonna show you some energy saving uh, slides in just a few minutes. Now they also apply themselves nicely to commercial buildings because you can install them in one of two ways. On the left here, you see that we do a floor by floor installation. This is a multi-story building, different occupants or different tenants in each floor. So each gets their own air conditioner. So they each get their own condensing unit and their series of indoor units connected to it. This gives us some flexibility because it allows us to maybe put these on separate floors, different outdoor units, hook up a module like our pulse input module that monitors energy consumption. And because each unit or each uh, floor has its own condensing unit and indoor units, you could essentially do tenant billing by watching how much energy each one consumes. Or alternatively, what some folks do is have these units spread out floor by floor so they have some redundancy, meaning that if one unit is down, they have three other zones in the building that are still comfortable. Now, this is a normal installation that we see in a lot of other places where they install them as a group. They put all the units in one area, uh, up or down, depending on where they want to put them, and then they run the refrigerant piping to wherever they need to go. Now you may be thinking, okay, that's a lot of copper. How can I do that? Well, you can, because of the way the system's designed, you can have thousands, that's right, 
thousands of feet of copper. And the nice thing is, is when we're looking at a building like this, instead of running large bulky ductwork, we're running really small chases to handle two or three refrigerant pipes throughout the structure. So it's much easier for the installation, but again, more flexibility no matter what you wanna do. So VRF systems, they do provide us superior precise temperature control. They're very high efficient systems. They have extremely low sound levels. They're really compact in size compared to, in comparison to unitary products, whether that's a refrigerant, a split system, a, a package rooftop or chillers, right? We've got all of that. We can control room by room. So each individual room can have its own controller or we can group a series of rooms together to make a zone. And as you see in this image here, one outdoor unit, one, what we call a MCU, a mode control unit. Other people call it a branch box, a branch selector. There's lots of different names for it. But with this branch selector or mode control unit, we can send the right volume of refrigerant at the right temperatures and pressures to heat here, this side of the building. And at the same time, we can send a different quality of refrigerant, still the same refrigerant, just in a different condition to cool these two zones that are in the blue here and here. And again, that's all off of one outdoor unit. So that's that simultaneous heating and cooling. The other thing with VRF technology is it's very easy to incorporate building management systems. So right here, out of the box, you can get an adapter. You can make it completely compatible with Wi-Fi and hook up a Wi-Fi uh, thermostat or, sorry, hook up an app to it. Or you can integrate with any VRF system with an upper level control, whether that's BACnet, Lawn, Modbus, whatever that protocol is, these can integrate with it very well for total building control. So we have a question that comes up as I'm rambling here and I'm talking about heat pump versus heat recovery. What's the difference? What does it mean? Okay, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time diving into this and I hope the examples will help clarify any questions that you might have in your mind. So heat pump systems, look, heat pump system is great when the loads are pretty accurate across the space or they're even between heating and cooling. Maybe you have a system that doesn't get extremely cold or a city that doesn't get extremely cold in the winter. Uh, heat pumps are great. They are very high efficient systems because they're inverter driven. They provide heating or cooling. And just like a traditional heat pump, you're gonna run two pipes off of it, a liquid pipe or a liquid line. And that's gonna be fed to the indoor units that are gonna go into cooling. It'll hit the metering device. It'll change the pressure, lower the pressure, lower the temperature, and in such, you'll have some flash gas. You got your standard refrigeration process going on. And then after the liquid line, we have what we call a dual pressure line. And the reason it's a dual pressure line is because in the cooling mode, that line will be cool suction gas coming back to the compressor. But in the heating mode, it'll be hot discharge gas going to the indoor units. And that's how we get the difference between heating and cooling is having two different ways of delivering the refrigerant through these two pipes. Okay, heat pumps you're pretty familiar with. Again, the difference here is multiple zones, multiple indoor units, as many as you need to, to get the job done. Now, we also offer what's called heat recovery. And heat recovery really offers a bunch of multiple solutions to the end user. What is heat recovery? It's essentially reclaiming heat from other parts of the building. So I have on this structure, on this image here on the right, I have three units calling for heating, okay? And, but look at all the ones in blue. Now the ones are in blue, which is cooling. So that means they're absorbing heat from the building. Now, normally that heat that it absorbs would go outside and get rejected to the ambient temperature. But since we know we need heating in another part of the room, we're really just reclaiming the heat. We're sucking the heat out of these offices into the refrigerant, moving that hot, warm refrigerant over to the other units so that they can produce heating all at the exact same time. So that's simultaneous heating and cooling. And what you're gonna notice with Samsung and 90% of the VRF manufacturers out there is they use what's called the three pipe refrigerant network. To my knowledge, there's only two manufacturers that are not using three pipe. And what that does is we have three pipes that go from the outdoor unit to that mode control unit that I showed you earlier. And those three pipes provide liquid, low pressure gas, which is coming back from the indoor units to, to uh, have the heat rejected. Or, and then you have high pressure vapor, which work, works as a hot gas line to heat the space. So three different pipes carrying three different conditions of refrigerant all at the same time to maximize comfort and efficiency. And by reclaiming the heat from other portions of the building, 
our performance only gets better. Okay, so let's just do a simplistic overview of how this would work. So here we are, we have our outdoor unit and we're in the cooling mode right now. So what we do is we send the, the refrigerant to the mode control unit and we're gonna have liquid refrigerant travel through these line sets to each of these indoor coils. Now they go to a metering device and that's gonna rapidly drop the pressure and the temperature of the refrigerant so that it's cool enough that the heat inside the building will be transferred into the refrigerant. And then once these units have absorbed all the heat that they can out of the building, the refrigerant will be set back to the mode control unit. And in this example, because we only need cooling, that refrigerant will then travel back to the outdoor unit where it will reject the heat from the refrigerant, changing its temperature and its pressure so that we can start the process all over again. So that's what we call cooling operation. Now in heating operation, it's just the inverse. The outdoor unit is now acting like a evaporator coil. So air is passing through it. And no matter what the temperature is outside, we can still absorb heat out of the air, even at extremely low temperatures. Because if we go back to physics and we start talking about, um, we start talking about the rates at which you can uh, absorb or heat out of something, we can go very low, very low, because there's, there's a lot of latent heat in the air that you can't feel, but it's there, right? Until we reach that point of absolute zero, which is negative 469 degrees Fahrenheit, once we reach absolute zero, then there's no more heat available. But at any temperature above negative 460 degrees Fahrenheit, there's still heat in the air that my system, our system, can absorb and use to heat the space. So in heating operation, we're absorbing heat from outside. And what we're doing is we're bringing that hot gas refrigerant that we just have created. And that hot gas refrigerant is going through the mode control unit. And hot gas is hitting each and every one of these indoor units. Now, when we do that, that heat is going to see these indoor units. We're going to start transferring the heat from the refrigerant into the space. As we do so, the refrigerant changes from a gas, condenses down to a liquid. We run that liquid back to the mode control unit and back to the outdoor unit so we can absorb more heat and keep the process going. Pretty straightforward heating, cooling. Not much different than a regular heat pump, except we add an additional component in it. So the next option is what we call main cooling. Now, main cooling simply means that most of your indoor units are calling for cooling, but the remainder are calling for heat, okay? So this is where it really starts to get fun. We have these three units here that are absorbing heat. As they do so, they take the, the refrigerant that comes in and they boil it or evaporate it from a, um, a mixture to a pure gas, and then they superheat it, add additional heat to it. So that refrigerant then comes out of these units and as the refrigerant comes out of these units that it's absorbed heat, the refrigerant comes to the mode control box and it says, okay, I don't need to throw that heat outside. So I'm gonna take that heat, I'm gonna take as much as I need that those three units absorbed and give that heated refrigerant to the indoor units that need heating. So I'm just taking from one zone, transferring to another and any refrigerant, any heat left in the refrigerant that I don't need for indoor units, it's then rejected from the mode control unit up to the outdoor unit where we're rejecting the heat to get rid of it. So that's main cooling. Now a question did pop in, is there a difference between VRV and VRF? What is it? There's absolutely no difference. Other than the fact that brand D, and I'll let you figure out who brand D is, were the innovators, they were the creators. And they called it VRV, variable refrigerant volume, which is the same thing as flow. Same exact thing, two different names. One's a trademark and one's a common term. Okay, so moving on, and thanks, Eric, for the question. Once we move on and we start talking about what we call main heating, this is just the inverse of main cooling. It means that most of the units are in heating mode right now. So they're rejecting heat into the space. As they do so, the temperature of the refrigerant is gonna cool, it's gonna drop, it's going to condense, and it'll turn into a liquid. That liquid that's been changed into, or that refrigerant has been changed to a liquid from the indoor units will now travel back to the mode control unit. It knows two units want cooling and they need liquid refrigerant. So they feed liquid refrigerant, the mode control unit feeds liquid refrigerant to these two units, which are now in cooling mode. And just in case we need additional heat for these heating units, well, that's where the condenser unit comes in place. Instead of just running the compressor at a consistent frequency, the fan motors at a consistent speed, it says, okay, I need more heat. 
let me change my rates and bring in more. So that's main heating. And then really logistically or, or legitimately, if we had equal zone loads, half the building or half the units were calling for heating, half were calling for cooling, and they were the exact same capacities, in reality, I wouldn't need to pull or reject heat from the outdoor unit. Yeah, was if I had the same, yeah. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, can I pop in with a quick question? Absolutely. Fantastic. So uh, one from Philippe, how does the system know when it's main cooling or main heating? Okay, so that's a really great question. And I probably skipped through that a little quick. Uh, main cooling and main, main heating is a, is a term dependent on how many indoor units are heating or how many are cooling. So if we're talking about main heating, like we were on this back slot, this previous slide, oh, went too far. Okay, here we go. Uh, here we go. All right, main heating. If you look at main heating, main heating means that more units are in the heating mode and then there are in cooling mode. So how does the indoor unit know which ones are in heating or cooling? It's because each and every one of these units has its own controller. And the command from the controller is not only being sent to the indoor unit, but because the entire system is wired on a digital network, everything's communicating. So the thermostats are talking to the indoor units. Thermostats in the indoor units are talking to the mode control unit. The mode control units, indoor, outdoor, or indoor uh, units and controllers are all talking back to the outdoor unit. So it knows that it's in main heating because it has more units calling for heating than cooling. And it does that by pulling every single controller or thermostat in the space. Now, inversely, if we were talking about main cooling, same process. It's simply looking at how many thermostats are telling the units to run in either heat or cool, and whichever other, which either has the greatest volume, that's the mode in which it operates. Does that make sense? I think we're good, Jose. Thank you. Okay, great. And if we have other questions that come up, please let me know. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, Philippe says it does, so good. I. I didn't confuse anybody on that one or talk too big in a circle. All right, <laughs> here we go. So that's main cooling, main heating. And then this equal heating and cooling needs, again, if they're balanced out, you see in the example here, I have two indoor units calling for heat, two indoor units calling for cooling. What I can simply do is take those refrigerants back to the mode control unit. The outdoor unit will only run at a very low frequency just to move refrigerant, not to absorb or transfer heat. And it's just the pump is gonna move refrigerant or the compressor it's going to move refrigerant from the outdoor unit or the indoor units in heating to the indoor units in cooling. And we're not using any energy, very little energy. So that's how equal heating and cooling is possible. Now, whether you see it really depends on the way the building is laid out. You have to have buildings having similar load profiles as well as same, same, uh, same adequate exposure diversity, a few other things that go into play. But no, it's possible that we could take the heat from one space and reject it to the other without every single component operating just that compressor at a low frequency to circulate refrigerant. Okay, again, if you have questions, please throw them in. Um, we will do our best to find every answer for you. And if I don't have it off the top of my head, we will get it and we'll get it back to you. So now we're gonna go ahead and talk about the heat recovery methodologies, which is nothing more than saying it's the way the units produce heating and cooling simultaneously. There's two main strategies, which we'll talk about. The first is what you're, what you're hearing from me. Now, if you take a look at Samsung, Brand D, Daikin, uh, LG, a lot of those other brands that you'll see out there, they use what's, the, what's known as the three pipe system. And that means that from the outdoor unit, we run three different pipes to that mode control unit that directs the refrigerant to the right spaces. Now that refrigerant that's coming out of it is high pressure, medium temperature liquid. That high pressure, medium temperature liquid will go to the units that are in cooling mode, so it can expand the refrigerant, dropping the pressure and the temperature. So they can absorb heat. The next line will be low pressure, low temperature suction gas. So from all those units in cooling, it's gonna change the temperature of the refrigerant a little bit, and it's gonna convert it to a gas or a vapor. That vapor has to get back to the compressor, and that's the purpose of the second line. But then the third line is high pressure, high temperature discharge gas. So after the compressor has compressed the refrigerant, and it's raised its temperature, it's raised its pressure, it's raised its amount of discharge superheat or the heat to the refrigerant added above the boiling point. We now have a refrigerant that can be sent to the units in heating mode to give heat back to the space. And as those units in heating mode start to condense the refrigerant by removing its heat, then that liquid refrigerant goes back to the outdoor unit. 
Okay, so uh, Christopher says, is there a difference between the MCUs and the heat changers? So um, MCUs are mode control units. And what they're gonna do is be the one that directs the refrigerant in any way. Now heat changers is typically a terminology used by some of the other manufacturers, but it does the exact same thing. All it is is really a, a maybe we could call it like a turnstile at a train station. It says, okay, you've got a ticket, you're going to line A, the next person behind you, he has a ticket, but he's going to line B, C, and so forth. Whether they call them a MCU mode control unit, a heat changer, whether they're calling it a branch box, a branch selector, they're all the same thing, solenoids and valves to direct the refrigerant to the right places. Uh, Aaron, he wants to know, how do you manage oil return when the compressor runs at low frequencies? Um, okay, so Aaron, I'm gonna answer that right now because it's a great question. When you have thousands of feet of refrigerant pipe and you have a compressor running at very low frequencies, you're gonna have a tendency to log oil out into different portions of the pipe because there's not enough velocity or suction pressure to pull the oil back. So the way most manufacturers do it is these VRF systems have what's called a uh, oil recovery mode. And what that means is that it, at certain times, the system will say, okay, and it's based on time usually, our default is seven hours. After seven hours of operation in whatever mode, for a few seconds, we're going to go into oil recovery logic, which means that we open up all the valves, we open up the volume of refrigerant, quickly shove a bunch of refrigerant through to draw the oil back, and we do it in such a quick manner that nobody is affected temperature-wise, okay? and that's oil recovery mode. And inside the system outside, there's a lot of other pieces to it. There's an accumulator and an oil separator, so once the uh, refrigerant lay or the oil laden refrigerant comes back, it first has to go into an accumulator that stores the liquid and moves the oil to an oil separator where that oil separator has a valve on it that injects the oil right back into the compressor. It's really cool. Now, if you have a really, really long line set or a lot of run between the building, we can actually change the frequency or the interval of oil return down to about three hours if you need to get that oil back faster. So hopefully, Aaron, that answered the question. Chris, I hope that answered the question for you. If not, please let me know and we'll address whatever we need to. We got one more from Mark underneath there. Oh, okay. What's yeah. Mark here? Uh, what is the lowest ambient temperature that these condensing units can run at? Oh, that's a great question. Out of the box, they will run all the way down to minus 13 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, obviously, that won't mean that they get 100% heating. As the ambient temperature drops, you are gonna get a uh, reduction in capacity. There's just not enough heat outside to absorb all the refrigerant. And then at that point, Mark, we would jump into our low ambient products. And those can give you 100% heating all the way down to say uh, five or minus 13, depending on how it's installed. And that low ambient product, we call a max heat unit. All right. Oh, just one second. Just a reminder, we'll have a Q&A session at the end as well. So um, if you have any questions uh, for then, please let us know. In the meantime, we got the Q&A chat open here. So if you have any pressing ones, uh, we will read them to Jose. Thank you, guys. I apologize for the delay. The Amazon guy decided to deliver a package and my, my dog went nuts. So I had to make sure we closed the door for that. Um, okay, so I see that we, uh, we answered Aaron's question. Um, uh, Philippe asked about room thermostats and... Uh, but that is something that we're going to talk a little bit about later, but a room thermostat or what we call a wired controller is in each space, and then it connects directly back to the air handler serving that space, and that's what makes the decision. Now, we don't call them thermostats because a thermostat would be a temperature-rated thermal device. These are not just temperature. They don't look at just temperature. They look at RPMs, difference in humidity, difference in runtime, and so they're controlling or communicating thousands of variables back to the outdoor unit. So that's why we don't call them a thermostat. We refer to them as wired or wireless controllers because they do a lot more than just temperature and scheduling. Okay, now a three pipe system in the heating mode, you're gonna get high pressure, high temperature discharge gas to the indoor unit, high pressure, medium temperature liquid from the indoor units. And it does look make more sense on the next slide. So here's Samsung's three pipe system. 
And again, anybody who's using three pipes does the exact same thing, just in a different look, feel, and maybe a couple different operating parameters. But here, let's start with this unit. Let's we'll start with this unit down here. This is in the cooling mode. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this orange line, which is high pressure, medium temperature liquid, and it's going to come out of the compressor here. It's going to run to the mode control unit. And then out of the mode control unit, it's going to come down as a liquid to the indoor unit. That indoor unit's going to reject the heat into the space, causing the refrigerant to evaporate and then become a cool suction gas due to the pressure temperature drop. And now that cool suction gas comes from the indoor unit back to the mode control unit, and then finally back to the outdoor unit. Okay. Now at the exact same time, this unit up here is asking for heating. So what we're gonna deliver to it is high temperature, high pressure discharge gas right off the top of the compressor, where it's at its highest point, okay? Highest point, highest amount of heat in there. And that high pressure, high temperature gas is gonna leave the condensing unit. It's gonna go into the box, the mode control unit, the branch selector, whatever you want to call it. And then that hot temperature, that high temperature discharge gas is going to travel on this line to the indoor unit. It's going to start rejecting the heat from that high temperature, high pressure gas. It'll condense that refrigerant back to a medium temperature liquid on the orange line, which routes right back to the mode control unit. From there, we can redirect refrigerant through this box, which has solenoids and, and valves. We can redirect that heat wherever we need to. Whether that's we need to go outside and throw heat away, or we throw that heat to a different indoor unit, that's what we do in a three-pipe system, three dedicated pipes. Okay. Now, there, are an, there is another methodology. So if you're not doing three-pipe, you're doing two-pipe. Those are your only options. And what two-pipe's going to do is instead of having three distinct lines of pressure, you only get two lines. One line carries pure liquid for the units that are going into cooling. The other one carries low pressure, low temperature, saturated mixture. So that, that second line is part liquid, part vapor. It's a mixed phase is what we call it. And then what we're going to do is from that mixed phase refrigerant, we're going to have a collection box or an accumulator type thing inside the branch box. We're going to pull the liquid from the bottom and the vapor from the top to our indoor units. So let's take a look at that. In the cooling mode, the refrigerant is going to leave that outdoor unit as a, as a high pressure, medium temperature liquid. And that's represented by this, this beige uh, line here. And it goes into what's called a liquid gas separator. So what I want you to visualize there is taking a bottle of water that's half full and tilting it on its side. If you tilt it on its side and lay it on the desk, the bottom half of that water bottle has water in it. Above it is a vapor, air, expanded water, whatever that looks like. So there's two different types of, of water in that water bottle when you turn it sideways, pure liquid or vapor. We do the same thing. We feed the mixed phase refrigerant into this liquid separator. The liquid falls to the bottom. The vapor is obviously on top. And then if we need a unit in cooling, we're going to take the liquid refrigerant from the bottom, route it through the lines up here to the outdoor unit, where it's going to drop the temperature, the pressure, and evaporate that refrigerant into a gas. And that gas will come back to the mode control unit. And it's going to come back to the liquid gas separator. Now, if we have a unit that needs discharge gas, here it comes off the top of the separator and goes to that indoor unit. So I made a mistake there in my delivery. Let me just straighten that away. Liquid comes off the bottom. It's going to run on the liquid line to the unit in cooling. We're going to absorb the heat and change the refrigerant to a gas. That gas goes back to the compressor. Now, at the same time, the liquid gas separator has the line on top, which feeds the refrigerant to the indoor unit so we can generate our heating. And that's kind of how that works. It's really the difference there is the direction that they're changing the refrigerant and how they do it, the methodology behind it, either three pipes or two utilizing a phase separator. So there's advantages and disadvantages to both. And I wouldn't be doing a good job unless I address both to you because manufacturers have these advantages and disadvantages that we try to work with. And it's just a matter of how we overcome it. So if we're looking at a three pipe system, what you're going to get is a system where the outdoor unit is physically smaller. So here's ours. Here's another brand. Same tonnage, much larger unit. In a three-pipe system, you're going to have mode control units closer to the indoor units. So you run your three pipes to one box. And then you have short runs, typically a flexible copper, to go to the indoor units, smaller line sets. 
Now, the other advantage, which is really a big standard, especially for us in the U.S., and I know you guys have your own version, is something what we call ASHRAE Standard 15. And that means that we can't put too much refrigerant in one zone, because if there's a leak, refrigerant displaces oxygen, and then with the displaced oxygen, we cause suffocation, okay? So that's what we're looking at there, is, is we want to minimize refrigerant charge. But notice, a two-pipe system, this is our advantage and a two-pipe's disadvantage, two-pipe systems on an average have 64% more refrigerant in the system than, than a, a three-pipe system. So that's going to become a place where we need to investigate how we're going to design the building because of that excess volume of refrigerant, and we can't expose most of that refrigerant or a lot of that refrigerant to one small space. Okay. All right. Then the other advantage that we have with heat recovery is that we have, again, that lower total volume of refrigerant. And that volume of refrigerant decreases because, one, we have smaller pipes. We don't have phase separators or that big uh, water bottle laying on its side. We don't have that, so we don't have to store refrigerant in there. And then if we take a look at this final note, two pipe systems on average have 15 to 62% less additional charge. And I know we're looking up here at 64. Here we're looking at 62. It all just depends on the mode of operation, the frequency it's running. And it has to do with another thing we have called diversity, meaning that we can have a larger quantity of BTUs on the indoor side than we can on the outdoor side. And that's because in a commercial building, you very rarely have the same amount of heat needed in every room. So having a greater adversity means we can have more indoor units and use a smaller outdoor unit and still have enough refrigerant and uh, control of flow to get where we need to. Some other advantages of a three pipe system. Okay? Our branch box, our mode control unit is much smaller and lighter on average. We're 30%, uh, the two, uh, two pipe box is 36% wider, 48% taller, and weighs 102 pounds. That's the, mo that's the branch, board, uh, branch box mode control unit itself. Itself weighs 102 pounds more than a mode control unit. Not 102 pounds total, but 102 pounds more weight than this three pipe box. Yeah. Other advantages of a three pipe box. Since you don't have a phase separator, you don't have to worry about having a condensate drain line connected to these. Two pipe branch box, they usually have a three quarter inch PVC line to drain the water that condenses around that phase separator. Now these MCUs, because there's no phase, uh, phase separator and a few other things inside of it, there's not the high velocity refrigerant sound that you hear with the two pipes. And of course that's gonna get to greater efficiency. We have lower pressure drop in the refrigerant because of the way the piping is sized and we're not using a separator to divide them. And we used to have a higher condensing temperature in two pipe systems because we have to keep the refrigerant higher temperature to make it to that phase separator. So big advantages on the three pipe side. Now I did see a question came in, um, room thermostats, are they single or two stage or modulating? Uh, they are 100% modulating. In other words, they see the temperature, they send it to the controller and the controller, and the, I'm sorry, to the outdoor unit and it starts to work. These controllers are not only looking at the temperature, they're looking at the humidity, and they're looking at runtime. And from that, they're going to calculate a math of, okay, I'm running this long, I have these temperatures, I have this pressure operating on the unit that's being told to me from the outdoor unit. Let me change my capacity in that room. I don't need 12,000 BTUs anymore. You know what? I only need 3,000 BTUs. And it sends that control to the outdoor unit. So they're not really single stage and they're not modulating. They're completely digital communication that's looking at hundreds of control points and deciding how to run. So I guess we would say they're complete modulating systems. They do that through a digital control network. And one more timely question there, uh, Jose, yeah. from Kenneth. Is this using R410A? Absolutely. Yes, yeah. these are all using R410A. Now that's something that's a discussion that's going on right now. And a lot of manufacturers are leaning, leaning towards R32, which is a portion of what's in R410A. But R32 has a higher flammability. It's an A2L refrigerant instead of an A2 refrigerant. And that higher flammability means that we do have a potential for if every condition was right, all the, all the planets in the sky line up, there could be a potential for an ignition source or flame. Very little percentage, but that's always a possibility. And you have to change the way you design. We are still using R410A and Samsung still investigating what refrigerant they're going to use. 
because our goal would be able to make it with the minimal amount of changes and have a refrigerant that's going to be safer and have a much lower flammability rate and maybe not even be an A2L. So still a lot of stuff investigation. Right now, it's all, all still our 410A. Okay, so as we go ahead and look at three pipe systems, they do have their disadvantages. I don't want you to think I'm sitting on a soapbox and screaming, hey, you know what? This is, this is the best way to go. Three pipes do have their disadvantages that we need to focus on. First off, pipe lengths, right? As you run more linear footage of piping, you have to account for what the pressure drop is in that pipe. And if the pressure drop gets too high, you have to change or increase the size of your lines to avoid condensing and pressure drop, okay? So if the pipe lengths are long on a three pipe system, that does mean that the three pipes going to the first branch box or mode control unit, that means that we might have to change the sizing of piping there. Now, where does this come into play? Well, it only really comes into play when you design system on our design software and then the installation requirements change, meaning, meaning that they change because somebody ran the piping around a curb, over a bend, the, the plumber guy got there first, the electrical got there first, or the drywall guys got there first, we have to change the direction the refrigerant goes. That might mean on a three pipe system, you have to change the three main pipes, but, but that is a possible thing, but it's not, it doesn't happen a ton. Because these units are so customizable, that instead of having to change the refrigerant pipes, 90 plus percent of the time, you can change operational characteristics on it and it'll still work. That other 10%, well, we made this, you had to have made a, a significant miscalculation in the amount of line set. And by doing so, then of course, we have to um, account for that by changing the main three pipe sizes. So that is, is a possibility, but it's something that you want to be aware of. How do you solve that? Well, make sure that we use our software. Every manufacturer has designed software where you're going to input line set lengths, you're going to input vertical separation, you're going to input control networks, how you want it to be operated. That reports then and come back and say, okay, based on what you tell me you want, here's how many feet of five eighths, three quarters, seven eighths, inch, whatever that looks like. Here's how many feet of pipe you need to purchase and how much extra refrigerant you have to add. After you weigh in the refrigerant, you're good to go. But if you, if you greatly change that, just know that there is a possibility that we need to look at that pipe sizing. Now, 90 plus percent of the jobs I've been on, even though there are additional lengths added to get around obstacles, I've never really seen it be so much that we've had to change a main pipe size because we have some wiggle room being that it's a truly inverter driven system. And why is pipe size critical? Because it's going to prevent oil from being logged out. Too large of a pipe, oil's going to want to puddle. You'll need a higher suction pressure to pull it back, right? Um, so that could be an issue. Uh, the other thing that pipe size is good for is if you reduce the pipe sizes, you have pressure losses. That pressure loss is going to mean that you've lost capacity because you're transferring refrigerant from having it the availability to absorb and reject heat. You're transferring it to losses of heat that transmit through the copper pipe, which means you're going to have less capacity to get to the indoor units. Got to be honest with you. These are things that could happen. Do they happen? I've hardly ever seen them happen. Because if we go back into our design software and we say, okay, I'm not running 20 feet of, of three eighths, I'm running 150 feet of three eighths, it's going to come back and correct it for you and tell you what you need to do. Okay, so as we talk about two pipe advantages, it does have some advantages, right? From the outdoor unit to the branch box, you're only running two pipes. That's less copper, right? Less labor, okay? If the original pipe lengths change, so if all these pipe lengths changes on the ones going to the indoor units, they change, I'm probably not going to have to change the, change the main pipe size because all the change, all of the um, changes that we're doing to the refrigerant take place in the branch box. So they might be a little simpler to install because you only have two lines. Maybe you have fewer mechanical connections. There are challenges though. For example, this main BC box, this branch controller, this one might be a 16 port box. It can give you 16 indoor units. You need more, you have to run a sub branch controller. Now it becomes a three pipe system because all the magic's done inside here to change the quality and condition of the refrigerant. But because these units need to have their own branch box, we're gonna have to feed three pipes to them. So here's what happens a lot is whatever refrigerant length you save on the outdoor unit to the branch box, the minute you add a second unit, you're adding that refrigerant length right back on. So that's, that's a disadvantage that you do have. 
The other disadvantage is that if you notice this main box, it'll go somewhere in the building, but every single indoor unit has to run back to the main box. What we do is we provide one mode control unit. It may have 12 ports. Then we take piping and go through the first unit to another unit piped in series. So we have two mode control units in series, and therefore we have 24 ports now. So it still gives you the flexibility. I, I've having shorter runs to the indoor units. These here, every single indoor unit's got to go back to the branch box. And if this is inputted on the right-hand side of the building and everything is going out towards the left, you're going to have some long line set lengths. Some other disadvantages of two pipe, and these are really where the difference comes in, is that depending on the layout, you're going to need extra copper, anywhere from 11 to 81% more copper. You're going to have increased labor and material because of all the copper and the brazing, which is one of the points where people are struggling in our industry right now is finding qualified guys who can braze. You're going to have larger and heavier MCUs. Remember, 102 pounds heavier uh, on average. You're going to have mode control units that have to have a PVC drain. And because the cond condensate water off that drain is really low, just slightly above freezing in some points, you're going to have to insulate those drain lines. The mode control units on the two pipe are at least four decibels louder than the three pipes. And the additional refrigerant charge, again, 15 to 62% more refrigerant charge. And with what the cost of refrigerant is doing right now, regardless of what style you're using, that's pricey. Okay. So if we take a look at a summary here, I wanted to give you a quick summary. I ran a lot out you. This is an actual mathematical calculation we did comparing two pipe and three pop jobs of the exact same layout. We laid one out in three pipe software, one out in two pipe software, same linear feet, same capacity, same quantity of indoor units. And let's take a look. Okay. All right. This first box right here, we're looking at total pipe, okay? The average total pipe for two pipe system versus a three pipe on average was 141.7% more copper for two pipe. The minimum was 111.4% more copper than a three pipe. If we did the, the max, I'm sorry, the average was 141.7, the max, we had some units that ran up to 181.9% more copper than a three pipe job. So you're saving a lot of money. Copper is expensive. Now let's look at base charge, the amount of refrigerant that came in the unit before you even hooked up to it. Okay. Oh, excuse me, just one second. Okay, so if we're looking at base charge, this is the charge that's added by the factory. The minimum base charge was that the two pipe system had at least 90.4% of the total volume of refrigerant in it compared to a three pipe. So on the minimum charge, it, it was actually a win in their favor. But let's look at the average was on average, they had at least 107.3% more refrigerant in the unit from the factory. And the max came out to be 124% more refrigerant than a three pipe system added by the factory. Okay. So again, larger volumes of refrigerant, longer pipe lengths, larger volumes of refrigerant. Okay. Now, and we're looking at the additional charge, right? You put your piping in, you need to add more refrigerant from the two pipe system. And that's your, refri your refrigerant added for the three pipe system. So we've already got the base charge in it. This is how much refrigerant we need to add. On average down here, the two pipe system would require 164% more refrigerant than a three pipe. The minimum was 132%. And then the maximum, there were some units that actually needed 215, 215% more refrigerant than a two pipe system. Okay. Total charge then again, you're gonna see on average, the three pipe was 1.35 higher than the um, two pipe, uh, three pipe system. And then we had the maximum charge was on average, 162.7% more refrigerant volume for a two pipe system. Okay. So again, that's where the comparison really comes in because the cost of refrigerant, the cost of copper and compliance with refrigerant volume concentrations becomes really critical in a VRF system. You need to minimize that as much as possible. Now I'm gonna blow the horn a little bit early, but Samsung, our newest VRF lineup, which is coming out this year, uh, probably next month, our DVMS2 is gonna have a ability to re further reduce the size of the liquid line, reducing an additional 30% uh, reduce, reducing the amount of refrigerant by about 30% compared to our normal units. So we are working hard to minimize that charge as much as possible. Okay, again, if you have questions, please throw them in. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Now we're gonna talk about the ability to have that simultaneous 
heating and cooling. This is what heat recovery does. Well, Jose, we've got a couple questions. Do you want to wait till the Q&A session in a few minutes or do you want to answer oh, them now? Uh, yeah. I'll tell you what, if you think it's good to take it now, I can definitely take them. If you want them, if you want me to keep moving, just let me know. Uh, you know what, keep moving. We'll save these uh, towards the end. About uh, okay, one Sounds here. great. Yeah. So when do you need simultaneous heating and cooling? That's the big question here. Okay. So here's some applications where we did use it. We had a commercial building. Uh, the rooftop was 70% glass and it was a restaurant. Okay, so we need cooling all the time. Downstairs, shopping mall, they need cooling all the time. We get to office spaces, a few people out, you know, in the office, we need cooling. So we've got heating, heating, and then one zone and cooling. Okay. So we look at schools. There's zones everywhere. There's auditoriums that are barely operated, but when they do, they're at max capacity. Computer rooms that always need cooling. Server rooms that need cooling. Classrooms that need heating because there's only 20, 25 kids in there. You, you have all these different demands at the exact same time. Before to zone that out, you'd have to have multiple package units, right? Or multiple water source heat pumps or whatever you like for your layout. Here we can do it with one VRF system. Medical buildings, okay, hotels, apartment condos, you're getting the idea they have different load requirements at different times. But here's just an example of a house, right? A larger house, it's got two different heat recovery systems on it. Well. Study needs heating. Sitting room needs heating. Bedroom needs heating. There's not a lot going on. Media room, TVs, projectors, surround stereo systems. They're going to generate a lot of heat. They need cooling. And if you're cooking in the kitchen, you need cooling as well. You get it with one unit now. And this, again, just showing you here one more thing that helps you with three-pipe systems and uh, simultaneous heating and cooling. There's our first branch box or mode control unit. Notice the piping is coming off to the right, and we're feeding these units. We go in series with the second mode control unit or branch box. We rotate it 180 degrees, which it can do. And now we have piping coming off the left side. No piping up, over, and then back down, which is additional piping, additional braze connections, things to worry about. Okay, I know we're running short on time, so I'm gonna try to get through these. If we go over, I'm fine, but I don't. I wanna be respectful of your time. Energy savings, big difference. These are the terms that you'll hear out there, but let's do a side-by-side -side comparison. Here we're taking a six ton package rooftop unit and a six ton max heat, our low ambient product, because I wanted the one that will pull the most amperage and I want a side-by-side -side comparison. If we're looking at EER, energy efficiency ratio over the entire year, this comes in at an 11.2, this comes in at 11.3. It's actually no gain. I'm actually pulling a 10th of an amp more. But let's go to part load performance, right? Because equipment's hardly ever at full load. Let's go to part load performance and we're going to change from EER to IEER, Integrated Energy Efficiency Ratio. The six ton is now 11.3 IEER, but our six ton max heat, the highest amp draw one I can pull, it's only pulling is, is rated at a 29.3% -E IEER. So just by going from rooftop to VRF, you're automatically saving about 40% of a reduction in energy comparison or consumption. But it's not just the energy consumption. We have to look at the entire life cycle of the product to understand its cost. So you're going to have installation with almost no ductwork. You can select smaller size units outside because you're not dealing with the heat loss and heat gain of ductwork in unconditioned spaces. You don't have to condition rooms that are not occupied. So if you have a, a building where all the exterior offices are conditioned until midday at lunchtime, then you transfer that heat over. Okay? And the system modulates the capacity instead of shutting on and off. So it is truly saving energy. Okay, and let's take a look at the acoustics char acoustic characteristics of them. These units are amazingly quiet, and let's do a benchmark. So sounds one of the most thing, one of the most important av avenues or values of human comfort. We get temperature, we get humidity, we get velocity. Sounds the last element. If we don't control the sound, people are uncomfortable. So we got to look at indoor and outdoor sounds. So let's do a comparison. Outdoor units, a commercial split system, averages about 85 decibels outside. Five ton rooftop unit, about 81 decibels outside. You're using a unitary condenser or residential condenser unit, average 80 decibels outside. Our Samsung VRF outdoor units come in at 60 decibels, which is right around a conversation. Indoor units is really amazing because if you're looking at an average water source heat pump, that DBA is about 75. An average PTAC, just you know, a, a window unit on steroids, is 54 decibels. Average VAV box, you're doing a VAV system, you got a VAV box with the chilled water coil, dampers, whatever. That's on average 40 decibels. Our Samsung indoor units are as quiet as 23 decibels, which is a little bit right or a little bit over the sound of a watch ticking. If anybody still has analog watches, right? Almost everybody's going digital now. Okay, 
So that's where the acoustic stuff's coming in. Last section here, we're almost done, is solution strategies. Why is VRF better for a building than unitary? Well, let's take a look at it. The earlier we can throw VRF into a building, the less money it's going to cost to build that building or to assemble that building. And here's why. Because without the ductwork, or even with lower amounts of ductwork, you can have lower plenum height between the floors and floors. You reduce that, guess what you do? You can add another floor to the building or leave it is with less structural weight. The chases that you might have to run, I love this picture because here you go. Here's the, the ductless, the VRF. Look, two copper pipes that run back on a small channel. Over here's the VAV box or the VAV ducting. Look how big and round that ducting is and look how many feet of it we have. It hangs down significantly lower than the VRF unit, which means I, it's going to change my size of my, of my plenum. The weight. These units are much lighter and much smaller than going with a unitary product, chillers, cooling towers. They take up less space and they take up less weight. You don't have to build the buildings as reinforced as you did. And look, what a lot of people are doing is putting the VRF units on the side and building a rooftop penthouse, you know, a relaxing area, a lunchroom, whatever that might look like. Again, they're utilizing more of their building space for rentable spaces. Electrical, these things consume so much lower amounts of power that the MCA, the minimum circuit ampacity, and the maximum overcurrent protection, your wire size and your breaker sizes, drop significantly, which means you'll need less power delivered deliver to the building. Remember, the HVAC and mechanical can equate to over 60% of the total electrical consumption in a building. Okay. Simplified, simplified plannings. You're going to get simpler systems. You're going to run three pipes to a box, two pipes to an indoor unit, right? You're going to have simple controls for easy operation. You can zone these out amazingly well because you have an air handler in each zone. And as COVID has come up, there's a big push in buildings to not have air from one zone mixed to another. If you do straight ductwork, you don't have a say-so in this. But you put a unit in each individual zone, it only handles its airflow. You don't have cross-contamination from one zone to another. The procedures to install it, I don't care which brand you're using, they're going to be the same all the way across. Commissioning, as easy as this guy right here with a laptop and a communication cable to what we call our upper level, upper, upper level controls, and say that fast three times, he can sit here from his laptop and commission every one of these rooftops. And because it's a digital network, if he doesn't want to be on the roof commissioning all the units, fine, go in the condition space, sit in an office, hook up your adapter to the internet, and, and a commission all of these units in a conditioned space. Okay. Installation efficiency, okay? You're bringing up a rooftop unit, you're gonna need a crane, uh, you're gonna need a helicopter. Well, look at the size of VRF units. This is our VRF, our largest VRF unit. It fits on a pallet and goes up a freight elevator. Okay, then once it gets up there, you got a three or four guys who can pick it up and move it into place. And then of course, we get right back to precise temperature control controller in the individual space. It only cares what's happening in that room. And if we, even if we have 64 indoor units on one outdoor unit, if one zone's calling, it's turning on and it's going to meet the needs of that zone because of how far down that unit can throttle in capacity. Design software is incredible. Our design software is called DVM Pro. Every brand has one. You can run it into what they call a sales mode, which is just a simple design. Or with the click of a button, you can design it all in AutoCAD. You can import the blueprints and design it right in AutoCAD with no additional CAD software. It's the program, at least ours, has the CAD function built right into the program. So you don't have an add-on, you don't have a plug-in that actually has CAD software built in. This simplifies the design and meets the flexibility of what you need. So here's the solution, right? The solution is offer VRF. Offer it every time. Learn more about VRF and you'll get to be the point where this is your bread life, right? Remember, if you don't offer it, you're never going to sell it. VRF is the solution for simple installations, lower construction costs, increased energy savings, increased occupant comfort. You're going to have differentiation as a, as a manufacturer or as a contractor, distributor who has a product that really does meet every need the occupant has where other systems can't. They might tackle temperature, but miss humidity. They might miss humidity, and, or they might get humidity, but lack in sound or struggle with sound. VRF does all of that for you. And here's the thing. If we take a look at compound growth rates between unitary and VRF, unitary grew about 12 to 13% on average last year. VRF grew about 39%. We keep that trend up. And in a few years, maybe by the time we hit 2025, you're going to have VRF sales equal with unitary. Then they're going to overtake. 
having been all over the country here, all over the world and seeing these in Korea and seeing them in, in Brazil and other places where it's only VRF offered, you can see it's going to change the mindset and take over. So grow with VRF and have that opportunity. Yeah. Okay, at that point, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, if we have questions, I'm happy to answer anything that you guys have. You bet. I think uh, some people need to get back to work, but we do have some questions. We can do some uh, rapid fire with you. Absolutely. Fantastic. Okay, so I, I saved some. Uh, from Aaron, does Samsung have a dehumidification set? Okay, so great question. Do we have de dehumidification options? We do. We have an option on every controller that's called dry mode. And what that's going to do when you energize dry mode is going to keep that relative humidity in space by slowing the fan down across that coil. Fan slows down to contact with the coil more, ring out more humidity. Fantastic. Uh, what is the weight of your MCU for comparison? It depends on the size. Uh, and I would have to go look them up. I will not say that I know it off the top of my head. But if you want to find out, go to our website, samsunghvac.com. Go to the technical tab and training. You'll see technical documents. And every piece of literature we've ever manufactured is on that page. No password needed. You can just go in and grab and download anything you want. Thanks. That was from Ethan. Uh, next one from Ethan as well. How far does the outdoor unit uh, turn down? Okay. So like I said, you have a six-ton unit. You have one 5,000 BTU indoor unit calling. It's going to turn on. So huge. Remember, one indoor unit alone can turn that outdoor unit on, and it'll turn down to get there. Excellent. Um, uh, from Philippe, noise levels of the IDU? On average, about 23 decibels, which is significantly lower than any other indoor unit, including that VAV box, which is around 40. Now, if you have ducted units, they might get a little bit louder because the sound of duct units is dependent on the static pressure and the design of the ductwork. But on average, we're sitting at around 23 decibels, which is less than a, than a, a little bit more than a watch ticking. Thank you. This one from Aaron, I'm going to read it verbatim. Uh, how are they rated? ARIS standard 340, 360 under heat pumps. Uh, he's just curious. He's not sure if there's a standard for VRFs. Okay, so I'm not going to claim to know the actual names of the standards. I am mm -hmm. going to tell you that they're built around IEER, which is efficiency at part load. Part load values are configured into it. Um, but they are also rated like a heat pump. So the operation down to certain temperatures, they have D rate values. And if you want to know more, Go to our website, again, Samsung HVAC, go to the technical documentation, find a unit and download what we call a TDB, a technical data book, and you will see how they're rated and what conditions. I know heat pumps are typically rated at 47 and 14, but ours perform a lot better than just 47 and 14. Our max heat units can provide 100% heating down to minus 13. Thank you so much. Three more for you. Roger asks, what is the smallest system available? Great question. The smallest VRF in three phase. The smallest in three phase is six tons. But we also have single phase VRF, which I didn't add to this presentation. Single phase VRF is, uh, looks like a traditional mini split unit outside, about 13 inches deep, about 40 some odd inches tall. That one can go all the way down to two tons. So if you have a single phase, phase application, two to five tons, if you go into three phase, you start with six tons. Lori asks, we need humidity. How will it do that? Okay, so there's no way for this unit or any other HVAC system to generate humidity. We can't do that. But what a lot of people are doing to add humidity is they're using a, they're decoupling their ventilation from their HVAC load. So they're bringing in ductwork that brings in outside air, brings in the ability to lower, raise the temperature of the outside air and control the humidity that way. But you could also add, you could integrate in a third party air hand or humidifier with the system. So at any given point, there are different contact points on the indoor and outdoor units where you can engage or activate an external con uh, external, devi external device like a humidifier. And last but not least, Sandeep asks, the maximum number of U IDUs. What is the maximum number of IDUs? The maximum number of indoor units, again, it's going to depend on the outdoor unit capacity. Mm -hmm. I want to say it's around 64 per unit. Uh, I think it can go higher than that, but I would be lying if I told you I knew exactly. I know a minimum that you can do. A minimum of the biggest quantity is 64, and I think it goes up depending on the outdoor unit capacity. Okay. Actually, we had one more sneak in here. I think this will be the last. Uh, for Renee, is your upcoming DVM-S2 coming out 575V? The, the question's in there. Is yeah. Upcoming, uh, yeah. No, we don't have anything rated at 575 at this point. Um, there was talk about it, but the actual volume of sales on it becomes pretty cost prohibitive. 
because even what we're finding, even in areas that have 575 right now, they are stepping it down to 208, 230, or 460 in a lot of those areas. Right. Super, uh, lots of information, Jose, a, a ton of great insights. Now, this will be available for uh, viewing after the fact, so we can, if people miss something, they can go back into it. Uh, do you have a contact uh, that people can reach you at, Jose? Uh, you've mentioned it before. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm going to actually put it in the chat box over here so everybody sure. has it. Sure. All right. I'm going to give you two email addresses, my personal one, and that's to me. If you have other questions, remember, I do this all the time, so I'm not always in the office, but I'm also going to give you a mailbox that goes to all of my training coordinators, and they can help find the right person for you to talk to at any time. So there's mine, and here comes the training request one. Awesome. As you can tell, a lot of people are really interested in the topic, so thank you so much for uh, telling us what you know. Awesome, and if, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a shameless plug here and note that coming up, uh, I believe it's the 15th of May, we have the second half of this, which is how to resolve the 10 misconceptions people have about VRF. The 10 things most people complain about and say, that's why I'm not going VRF. Well, I'm going to refute every one of them for you. <laughs> Look forward to it. All right. Well, I will see you then. And uh, hopefully a lot of the people on this call. Thank you. Thank you so much.